Thank you for having me and thanks everyone for, for coming out uh, tonight. I just wanna make sure, can everyone, what, they, what they're seeing on their screen, are they're seeing the full slide and nothing else right now. They're not seeing my Zoom. They're not seeing my Zoom windows, right? Joe, all we, all we see is your slides and you're in the upper right-hand corner Great. Uh, of your smiling face. Perfect. Well, I have you know a lot of slides to go through, so I think it'll be fun. And I, you know, I was asked um, to you know really try to put together a presentation that was really focused on Somerville. So I sort of dug through, you know, my research archive and and you know just picked out a lot of really great materials. Um, you know, whereas usually when I present about the book, I'm kind of like taking people through the story. I'm gonna hope and assume that most people here like pr are familiar with the story because. Um, this is going to be a little more of a local, uh, sort of a locally focused presentation. But for anyone, you know, out there who doesn't know anything about um, the Hall Mill story, which is which is what my book, uh, Blood and Ink, uh, covers, you know, this is a jazz age, a wild, roaring twenties uh, murder mystery about the the murder, double homicide of Reverend Edward Hall and Eleanor Mills. And Reverend Hall was a prominent Episcopal minister in New Brunswick. Eleanor Mills uh, was a choir singer in his church. Um, they were not married to one another. Edward had married into this very illustrious, rich uh, family in New Brunswick. Eleanor was married to the, uh, you know, the church sexton uh, at St. John the, the Evangelist Church in New Brunswick. So you have immediately, you know, this, uh, this, this story about this murdered couple, this, this, salacious affair um, involving all, all sorts of very colorful characters. And there's an investigation throughout the fall of 1922 uh, when the murder occurred. Doesn't really go anywhere. Four years later, the case is revived, which is really what brings it, brings the story into Somerville when there's this massive, you know, trial of the century at the Somerset, Somerset County uh, Courthouse. You know, that's, that's really like the top line summary of what of what this story is about. And, you know, my book in particular versus the other works about the Hall Mills case is also the story about the creation of tabloid media in New York City at the same time that uh, this this murder mystery is playing out and really about the role that the, 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 the tabloid press in New York sort of ended up playing in really, uh, you know, uh, I think, Kind of forcing the outcome of, of this of this case. So I hope everyone, if you haven't read the book, I hope you'll go buy it and you'll be able to read about this very complex, bewildering story in a lot more detail. But I really want to go through um, my presentation here and and take you through you know some of the Somerville history and and mostly a lot of this is going to focus on the 1926 trial, which I think is really where Somerville, as I said, starred in this story. So, you know, I'm going to start by reading with, with a little reading. This is uh, the beginning of, I think it's chapter 19 or 20 from, from the book. Um, this is the chapter that starts the section of the book right where I, where, I, where I write about the trial. And this kind of just sets the the tone of what it was like in Somerville in the fall of 1926 as this trial is about to begin. And, you know, the town has been completely turned on its head by this media circus that's rolled in with hundreds of journalists. So I'm just going to read um, a little bit of the beginning of this of this chapter to set, kind of set the scene. And I have it here so you could read along uh, if you'd like. By early November, as Frances Hall and her brothers prepared to face a jury of their peers, Somerville transformed from a provincial backwater into the most heavily scrutinized town in the, in the United States. Nowhere else, it was said, could you expect to find so many journalists in one place, except perhaps for the national political, political conventions or the signing of the peace treaty at Versailles. More than 200 reporters, editors, and photographers from New York and New Jersey, from Washington and Massachusetts, from Pennsylvania and Kansas and Tennessee, had arrived to chronicle the proceedings, which even the most seasoned among them called the great story of a generation. Somerville would be their home for the next several weeks, which meant lodging was now the borough's most precious commodity. The Daily News reserved a whole floor of the Somerset Hotel, the lobby of which doubled as a social club for visiting scribes. Other New York papers took out leases on entire homes whose rents soared to $500 a month. An enterprising property owner welcomed 13 employees of the Daily Mirror who shared the house with a single black cat. Landlords weren't the only ones profiting from the influx. It was a boon to those who trafficked in bootleg liquor and games of chance, as well as to Somerville's legitimate entrepreneurs. 
One haberdashery owner reported that overcoats, shirts, neckties, and socks were flying off his shelves. Business is good, he said. But there was also resentment that powerful Hudson County politicians, at the urging of a troublemaking tabloid, had inserted themselves into local affairs. To believe that one sensational New York newspaper could cause all the recent proceedings and expense an editorial in the Somerset Democrat bemoaned does not sit well with the Somerset County taxpayers. Among the hordes of journalists tramping around Somerville were the beat reporters who had been following the story for months, including Herbert Mayer of The Mirror and Grace Robinson of The Daily News. The Evening Graphic sent Leo Casey and Jack Miley, both wonderful reporters, as a colleague recalled, our purpose having been not only to report the aroused sensation, but to make it plain should a conviction not seem likely that we, 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 the graphic, were quite innocent of having brought this trouble to Mrs. Hall, her brother Willie, brother Henry, and cousin Henry de la Brie Carpenter. In addition to their own Ooh, sorry. In addition to their own uh, staff, news, news outlets commissioned guest correspondents, employing ghostwriters as needed. The Post Syndicate secured the byline of Ethel Stevens, wife of Henry, and the Mirror boasted that its lineup would include Charlotte Mills, who had already produced a series of autobiographical articles for the famous Features Syndicate. Also on the Hearst tab was Richard Enright, a mystery author and former commissioner of the New York City Police. The graphic gave a column to the Reverend Dr. John Roach Stratton, who proclaimed in his God-fearing prose, anyone that strikes a blow at the sanctity of the marriage vow undermines the, undermines the foundations of the nations. Editors additionally sought out superstars like Theodore Dreiser and Mary Roberts Reinhardt, only to blanch at their staggering day, rights, day rates. Uh, although the novelist uh, Franny Hurst and Edna Ferber would end up parachuting in briefly. Dorothy Dix, the famed advice columnist and crime reporter, arrived in Somerville with a $1,000 weekly syndication agreement, and Francis Noyes Hart was assigned to the trial for the Washington Evening Star, an experience that would culminate in her pioneering 1927 courtroom novel, The Bellamy Trial. The dean of the Hall Mills Press Corps was Damon Runyon, a dapper, a dapper literary newsman and future author of the stories that inspired Guys and Dolls. Employed by Hearst's Universal News Service, Runyon was heralded by the Mirror as the greatest of all descriptive reporters. In a curtain raiser before the trial, Runyon observed that the spectacle had taken on some of the aspects of a big sports event. It wasn't merely a metaphor. A telegraph switchboard used two months earlier during the world heavyweight fight between Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney, Tunney had been installed in the courthouse basement with a staff of 28 operators at the ready. Four stenographers were on hand to record every word of the proceedings, hourly transcripts of which would be churned out by a bevy of mimeograph machines. At the local telephone exchange, eight additional switchboard operators were brought in to handle the increased volume of calls, including from the extra lines installed in hotel rooms and private homes. Inside the 300 capacity courtroom, folding chairs replaced swivel seats to accommodate as many as 130 members of the press who spoke of the trial as if they'd never seen anything like it. It's got the thaw case beaten by a, mar by a mile, one journalist marveled. It is the most fascinating and interesting case I have ever written about, another concurred. It has a combination of every element that makes a murder case great. So like I said, that just kind of gives you a sense of this kind of like circus atmosphere that um, all of a sudden was really like the the the, the, the scene in, in Somerville when this trial kicked off. And again, I didn't mention, but you know, in the in the in the mystery. Um, it was the the wife of Reverend Hall, Francis Hall, and her two brothers and a cousin who ended up going to, to trial, who ultimately were accused and became the main suspects uh, in this murder. And we'll talk about that, you know, we'll get into some of the details as I move along. Um, so, so what I just read, that passage, a lot of the details about, you know, the things that the hotel is filling up and, and the switchboard operators, all that sort of stuff, a lot of that color I got from this old... Um, article and editor and publisher, which is like a trade, a trade publication that covered the media from the day. So here they have like a front page article, um, uh, you know, just about literally about the all the media attention that um, had had come onto Somerville. You see 200 writers and photographers grind amazing grist of news at Hall Mills hearing file of 3000 300,000 words daily. So this is just, you know, to give a sense of how much you know, the press was even paying attention to itself as a spectacle in this. And this is a this is a picture from that same article just of, you know, a bunch of, you know, all the photographers that would have been there, um, you know, taking pictures every day for the various newspapers and, and newswires. And it says principles of the Hall Mills case run the gamut of a camera battery like this 
frequently these days. So this is kind of what you'd expect, you know, when you're coming to the courthouse and the witnesses are arriving and, you know, this, this kind of battery of flashbulbs and just a lot of, a lot of um, hubbub. I'm not sure how much this name resonates, uh, but Wallace Conover, I don't know if anyone here is, is familiar with that name. Wallace Conover, he was, this is his obituary from 1976, and he was the editor of uh, the Somerset Messenger Gazette. I think it was back then just called the Somerset Messenger uh, from 1931 to 1972. As you can see, he was he lived at 87 Spring Street in Somerville. He had worked for the, the New York World and um, the, the Daily Home News in New Brunswick before joining the Messenger. And I, I bring him up because he, as a young cub reporter for the Somerset Messenger, um, at the beginning of his career, he covered the trial. And I found when I was researching at, at Rutgers, where they have a really substantial archive that's mostly based on the prosecution files in the case. I was looking around for what else they might have of relevance, and I came across this the the the, the papers of Wallace Conover, and he has at the at the library at at Rutgers at their special collections and university archives. He left his papers pertaining to the case, and there's a lot of really cool uh, stuff in there. So, for instance, this is a list that he compiled at the time of all like the celebrity. Um, kind of, you know, writers that were parachuting in for the trial. I also used some of these details in that passage I read. So you could see he like knows that Edna Ferber was, came in for a few days at $1,500 a day. He has Theodore Dreiser, you know, he was, he, he became a famous mystery writer and um, a lot of places reported that he had covered the trial, but it seems that he actually didn't as, as Wallace, Wallace Conover confirms here because they wouldn't, they pay him enough, but just really cool stuff like this, that this, this, this guy left behind. Um, for, I guess, researchers like me to, to find one day. And I should say, you know, the public can go and view all this stuff as, as, as well if they want. Um, here's a, a front page of the Somerset Messenger from back then. Mrs. Hall in jail here on charge of murder. That's what the paper would have looked like uh, back then at the time of the trial. This was something that was really, really um, interesting in his file. This is actually a, a postcard. It appears from Francis Hall to Eleanor Mills. Now, those of you who are very familiar with the story, you know that in the weeks before the murders of, of Reverend Edward Hall and Eleanor Mills, um, Francis and Edward, they had taken their annual summer vacation to, to Maine. And famously, Edward and Eleanor, since they were going to be apart for three weeks and, and couldn't bear it, they they kept these, they, they wrote in love diaries for one another, um, these really kind of like steamy saccharine uh, love notes that they were going to exchange when they came back. But Edward also wrote correspondence to, to Eleanor and actually mailed her correspondence. And she wrote, you know, mail to him and they got it at, uh, you know, sort of the um, a, a post office off of the island where they were staying in in Maine. And apparently it seems uh, I at first when I first saw this, thought it was one of Edward's postcards. Uh, to Eleanor, but this is Francis's handwriting, and, and down here it's signed um, F. Uh, F. N. Hall. Her 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 name was Francis Stevens Noel Hall. Um, and Francis, uh, th these two families, the the Mills family and the Hall family, they did have like a relationship within you know from the church from Saint John the Evangelist, and they did you know have interaction with one one another. And Francis and Eleanor did have a rapport, um, so it's not totally surprising that she would have been. Um, you know, writing writing mail and corresponding with Eleanor, but it's I don't know how he actually got this postcard. It's actually the the actual original postcard in in his file. Um, so and I can't. It's hard to make out the writing, but I wanted to just show show you all because um, it's it's a pretty cool thing. And like I said, anyone can go and look through his his files, the Wallace Conover papers. This is something else really cool in in the Conover papers. This is you know over the years there was different. Um, times where there was talk of like, you know, sort of a Hollywood project about the Hall Mills case and none of them really ever came to fruition. So here you could see, this is a letter that Wallace Conover on the Somerset Messenger Gazette letterhead, uh, he writes to some guy at Avco Embassy Pictures and he's basically saying, you know, I heard that there might be developing a movie and he, and he says, I'll just read it here. The thought occurred to me that I might be of some help. I was 20 and a cub reporter then and this extraordinary story gave me lasting ties with some of the great newspaper men of that era. Um, and again, this is, you know, this was, this is kind of this, this local uh, reporter of record who, who, who was a big figure in, in Somerset. And he's, he's offering, you know, his assistance in the movie. He says, 
Uh, I don't know whether the planned movie is going to try and follow the real story or just hang a fictional story around the case. My only thought was maybe I could be of assistance in locations, properties, characters, uh, uh, and incidents. Um, and he's basically, you know, I, I, nothing came of this, but, you know, he's writing to try to give some of this color to these filmmakers and bring the local color to, to life. He says the colorful characters who could embellish the story should be duplicated, like Detective George Totten, the cigar chewing local sleuth some think was bought. George George Totten uh, was was a famous Somerville guy who was the the, the chief detective for Somerville, Somerset County for years and was the lead investigator on this case. Um, so he's 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 mentioning him and he's basically saying this is such a great story. You should cover it. I'll help you out. Unfortunately, no, nothing came of this. Um, but I thought this was another cool thing uh, to share that really showed um, the legacy I think this case had among people in the town. So moving along, how uh, do I hear him? I'm Does sorry. Talk? Someone uh, could someone say they can't hear me. I, I think uh, I think one of the I think one of the folks at home was not muted. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that person will ask their question later when we're finished. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and and I'm happy to to answer it. So the next the next few slides. At the time, you know, it was mostly like a newspaper story, um, newspapers from all the big New York papers. Like I said, the tabloid newspaper, the new tabloid newspapers that are, at, are really at the center of my book, but really newspapers from all over the country were, were, were converged on Somerville. Um, so was what was then a very brand new magazine called The New Yorker. I don't know if there's any New Yorker readers here, but I found in my research a series of three stories that um, a reporter for the early New Yorker, again, it was maybe less than a year old at the time. Uh, they came down and they did these three really colorful, fun dispatches, um, you know, kind of from Somerville, from the trial. The New Yorker had a very kind of high, high minded, dismissive attitude towards the whole case. They thought it was like this sham, this, this, this kind of like ridiculous, uh, you know, thing that had, that had been resurrected. And they thought this whole trial was kind of like a farce. And you can kind of, you know, perceive that. Uh, when you're reading, um, if you if you want to read these these old stories, but it's really fun um, just to read how the New Yorker covered this early on. And I actually wrote an, I wrote when I was promoting the book and doing excerpts and things like that. I wrote an article about um, the New Yorker's uh, coverage of the case, and you know, through that, the New Yorker actually um, digitized these three articles. I think Ali was going to put them put a link to in the chat where you could find them. Um, they're they're really fun. You can just go online and and you can read these articles that the New Yorker wrote about the about the the trial. And here's just a quick excerpt from one of them. This is by a reporter named Morris Markey, who is an early prominent New Yorker reporter. And he writes, "This trial of Mrs. Hall, Henry Stevens, and their half wit brother provides fascination for the connoisseur of murder annals in several respects. It is the culmination of the most absorbing crime considered qua crime in American history." It brings into public view for the first time the most curious and baffling figure connected with the episode, Mrs. Hall herself. It makes clear to us once more how far the men of law will go to display their virtuosity when the limelight is upon them. And it gives us a new opportunity to observe the futility of pursuing justice when justice is involved with politics and personal ambitions and the amazing stubbornness of small town gossip. I believe this, this passage, which I, which I love, um, and I quote in the book, I believe it's from the second article, which which is in print. It was called the Rights of Justice. And this this third article in the case uh, from uh, in the in the series, um, which is really kind of a dispatch from some you know a uh, few days of the trial. It's called the Somerville Follies. So uh, there it is, Summer, Somerville in the pages of the 1926 uh, New Yorker magazine. Uh, here we have two significant characters from the from the case, but particularly very significant characters uh, in, in Somerville, Somerset County history. So on, uh, I don't know if you see my cursor moving, but this this guy that the guy who is um, uh, does not have the glasses on, uh, on on the right. This is Azariah Beekman. He was the Somerset County prosecutor in 1922 when uh, this case uh, first broke out. And I should say the reason that Somerville came to play a role and Somerset County came to play a role in this case, as many of you probably know, is because 
These were all people from New Brunswick, New Jersey that were involved, the, the victims and the suspects and all their family members and the members of the church. It's very much all these people from New Brunswick, but the murder was was apparently committed. The bodies were found right over the border in Franklin Township uh, in Somerset County. And it was determined by the prosecution through soil analysis that almost certainly they believed that the, the murders actually had been committed there over the county line in Somerset County. So that's why it was George Totten, who is the guy you see next to Azariah Beekman with the glasses, who you know uh, took over the investigation as the lead detective and why Somerville really played, ended up playing the lead, the lead role in this. So these two guys, Azariah Beekman, he, um, he in 1922 wasn't getting anywhere. George Totten, the detective, he also wasn't really getting anywhere. There, there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, kind of like dead ends and sideshows and 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 whatnot. Eventually, the governor of New Jersey is fed up, and he brings in a special prosecutor to kind of like take over. And and Azariah, Azariah Beekman at that point is kind of like second second fiddle, and kind of happily so because this is just you know a mess for everyone. And I think that they probably didn't want to be dealing with this if they didn't have to. So so he and George Tott, and they were they were these are the two guys who were kind of the most in charge of the investigation in the fall of 1922, up until the point where this, this special prosecutor named Wilbur Mott, who is from Essex County, uh, comes in and takes over. Azariah Beekman, he, after this case, I don't think he was a prosecutor for too much longer. I don't know the, the dates exactly, but he eventually moved on to become uh, a judge. And in 1925, not long before this case comes back to life, he is in Manhattan out with a friend enjoying a night on the town. He suddenly collapses and his friend, you know, rushes him out of the city, drives, they drive as fast as they can back to Somerville. He ends up in the hospital and he's declared dead of what they called apoplexy, you know, had some sort of sort of stroke. And he ends up dying literally just within months before this the case is, is revived. And George Totten. He also shortly before this case comes back, he's kind of been shoved out. He, he, he's, he's, he's been pushed out of his position as the chief detective of Somerset County. He was bitter about it. He believes it was political because a new prosecutor had just come in and he had filed some sort of like appeal with the state to try to get himself reinstated. So he was kind of in limbo. And by the time the case came back in 1926 was not officially employed. So he did not have an official role when the case came back, though he was in the lead detective for the first leg of it in 1922. However, George Totten did not go away. Um, as I as I mentioned, you know, this case really came back to life because of this competition between these three tabloid newspapers in, in New York City that were really, each of them determined to try to bring this case back because they knew it would be such a boon to their circulation and to, and to business. And these, these papers were the New York Daily News, which was the first tabloid newspaper in America, um, they were the the New York Daily Mirror, which be, was a competitor that kind of uh, was started by William Randolph Hearst, the famous publisher, to compete and try to overtake the Daily News. And then a third tabloid, which is more of an also ran, but it's also relevant to the story. And it was just kind of this fun, wacky, crazy newspaper called the, uh, the New York Evening Graphic. But really, there's a strong rivalry between the New York Daily News and Hearst's New York Daily Mirror. So here we have a picture of George Totten again in, in the glasses, and he's sitting with the other guy to the left with the glasses, who's Phil Payne, who is um, one of the central, really main, one of the stars of my book. And he was an editor at the Daily News. He was the editor of the Daily News in 1922 when the case was first um, kicking around. And he even went so far as to after the after there were no indictments in that original case, he wanted to keep it going. He's like, you know, he 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 staged a fake seance at one point to try to see if they can get Eleanor Eleanor's widow Jim Mills to try to confess. I mean, it was really like stunty tabloid stuff. He was a pioneer of this, um, and eventually, you know, th that didn't work. But in 1925, he got fired from Daily News. Hearst scoops him up to run you know, the, the competing newspaper, the competing tabloid, the New York Daily Mirror. And he immediately gets back to work and says, let's go, let's try to bring the Hall Mills case back. And he sends one of his best reporters, who's the guy you see in the center, a guy named Herbert Mayer, sends him back down to New Brunswick and he starts digging around and they they basically find, um, 
new evidence. I mean, the evidence is is a is a um, it is a a word that is open to some interpretation. I guess they they found enough that they felt you know was worth reopening this case and casting suspicion back on Francis Hall and and her brothers. So he goes first to George Totten one day and at his private office in Somerville on Main Street and says, you know, look at what, all the stuff we found and we could really use your help to try to really bring this over the finish line. And George Totten kind of has nothing to lose. He's fighting for his, he's trying to appeal to get his job back, but you know, he knows it might not actually happen. Um, and, you know, there was a certain financial incentive because the tabloid newspapers, they were willing to pay. Uh, they, they kind of put George Totten on some sort of retainer and they know he, have, he has access to records, records from the original investigation. And he, with these two guys, um, this is the caption of this photo, the three men who turned New Jersey upside down. So really, Totten helped the Daily Mirror kind of put together this this dossier that ultimately is what the mirror brought to the state of New Jersey to convince them to reopen the case. So again, this tabloid editor, Phil Payne, who grew up in New Jersey in Perth Amboy, he ended up spending a lot of time in Somerville coming down here for different points during the 1926 uh, stage in the investigation and um, kind of ended up working very closely with, with George Time. And so what I'm showing next, this is something that is really um, really cool. And you are some of the first people outside of a very select few that are, that are ever um, seeing this. The backstory here, after, after Blood and Ink was, was published in, the, in uh, the fall of 2022, you know, people started coming out of the woodwork who had different connections to people from the case. I would get, get emails from people who, you know, had some connection to, to, to whoever. Um, but the most significant such development that happened was there was a woman in um, Portville, New York, this rural southwest southwestern New York state, who contacted the New Brunswick Public Library, who has a really amazing had already discovered this amazing trove of of documents um, related to the case that had been missing for a long time, and that that I relied heavily on in the book. And this woman contacts them and says, you know, I have. Um, I have the personal papers, eight, eight legal boxes full of the personal papers of Timothy Pfeiffer. That was Francis Hall's uh, personal attorney. And uh, this woman offered to, to donate them to the New Brunswick Public Library. And, you know, before they, they made their way to New Jersey last spring, I made my own trip up uh, to, uh, to see these records um, in New York, where they had been kind of just sitting, uh, sitting untouched for, for decades. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in there. I only had a few days to go through, but I wanted to show just this one snippet from them. So what you're looking at here, this is this is a letter from William Stevens, who is the oddball brother of of Francis Hall, who you know went to trial with 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 her sister, and you know was believed to maybe have actually been the one who who pulled the trigger. And um, he and his other brother Henry were arrested, as was Francis in the. In, in 1926, when this case came back to life, Francis was let out on bail, but Willie and Henry uh, and their cousin, Henry Carpenter, they were all, they, they were living in the Somerset County Jail for the duration of, of most of the fall until a trial took place. And this lawyer actually has Willie's jailhouse correspondence to him. So this is a letter that that Willie wrote to Tim Pfeiffer, the, their, their personal attorney uh, from jail. You can see Somerville, New Jersey, October 13th. 1926, his handwriting is very difficult uh, to read and there's nothing super revelatory in, in this particular letter. Um, but he's basically communicating with him and sharing ideas about what, you know, what kind of arguments he might make at, at, at the trial, any things he might help him. Dear Jim, do you remember when you spoke to us about going to see the family something something? I mean, it's just cool to see um, actually in his own hand, this, this really uh, outsized character from the case, um, you know, you know, these actual letters that once were in his hand in the Somerset County Jail right there in, in Somerville um, and to read them all these years, years later. There is also um, some correspondence that Willie would receive at, at the jail. So here you can see this is addressed to Mr. Willie Stevens, Somerville Courthouse, Somerville, New Jersey. I see the, the postmark here is November, November 6th. And this letter, just to give you a sense of all the type of, you know, potentially crazy mail that not only Willie, but like other characters from the case were getting Francis. I mean, this was kind of like, if you could imagine today, if you become like a, 
you know, someone who ends up in the news. I mean, people could just like find you on Twitter and your social media and this and that. Back then they just wrote them letters. And this letter is from a guy who, um, and again, I'm, you're really like some of the first people that are, that are, that are seeing this and take this with like a thousand grains of salt. But this is from some guy who's saying, why stay, why stay in the dark? The pigman killed Hall and Mrs. Mills. And he's basically saying that he was, he, he's claiming he was, a, he was a farmhand that was once employed by Jane Gibson, who was the famous uh, key witness uh, named the, the pig woman who comes forward and accuses uh, Francis and her brothers of having done this because she claimed to have seen them, but she was kind of like a very questionable, potentially unreliable witness um, that nonetheless became the center of the prosecution's case. And this, this, this is some random guy that's saying he was a farmhand of hers. And he's claiming that, you know, um, she, you know, he says the knife she used killing pigs, she used for the murders. And, and he's basically saying, you should look at, you should look at the pig woman. He's, and he's, he's giving him a way to, he's, he stays anonymous, but he's giving him a way to like contact him. He's saying, right, look, you know, right to this Polish newspaper in New York. He's, he was, a, he was, he was a Polish guy. So who knows? I mean, maybe this, maybe, maybe this guy had real information, maybe not, but again, it's just really fascinating. This is, like I said, a letter that Willie received, Willie Stevens received um, at the time right there in Somerville at, 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 at the, at the jail. So I wanted to, I wanted to share that. Um, this is more of that, of that same letter. This is something really cool. I'm going to play this video. So this is perhaps um, the, I mean, I would imagine it's maybe the only surviving footage from, from the case. Um, it's, I don't know the exact provenance of it. It's, it's, it's on Getty images, which is the, the photo um, licensing website that a lot of uh, news outlets use and, and other news organizations use to source photos and things. It, it appears to be from some sort of historical um, documentary about like early radio. And they have this little snippet about the Hall Mills case. And you'll see, once I play it, you'll see the Somerset County Courthouse. You will see like crowds. This is presumably, you know, crowds that were, were thronging the courthouse during the murder trial. And you're, you will also see, um, you'll see the pig, you'll see Jane Gibson, the pig woman uh, walking. You will also see Frances Hall um, with her attorney, Timothy Pfeiffer and her best friend, Sally Peters walking. Um, it's really cool. Cause you'll, this, you know, I had never seen, I'd, I'd spent four years uh, researching this book and you can only get so close to these characters. But, you know, when I first saw this and actually saw them moving and, and walking, it was, it was really something. So I wanted to play this for you all. You could get most of the sensational news from radio too. There was the Hall Mills case, complete with a pig woman. She was a key witness in a murder mystery that had everybody baffled. Mrs. Hall's husband, a preacher, had been killed in a Jersey back row, and so had the wife of James Mills. No one ever figured out why. So I, I think it's really I think it's really something um, <clears throat> to see that um, it's hard to find on 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 Getty Images and I I forget uh, how I found this again but you could try searching for this um, at the end if anyone wants to see this again you know after the questions like I'm, I'm happy to play it again um, I think it's really a, a really remarkable um, snapshot of of what it would have looked like at, at the time. Um, and on that note, I have a number of photographs that were taken, you know, from, from the trial. And if anyone has ever been to uh, the New Jersey State Archives in Trenton, they that is where the transcripts from the trial are, are stored. So it has, you know, 5,000 pages of literally the whole trial, all the witnesses who testified. And um, also in these bound volumes, uh, there's just throughout them, they have these photographs kind of just like, um encased in laminate so you'll see a lot of the i took these photos like with my iphone so you'll see there's like just some unavoidable glare but they're some of the, the best photos I've, I've i've come across um from the trial and again they show um you know what somerville looked like at the time and what what it was like if you were if you were living there and, and were you know coming to the trial you could see the courthouse right here um this is another one again, just like crowds. There's a woman with a with a with a, a baby stroller. Um, this guy here, this is Alexander Simpson. He was 
you know, the, the, as I said, in 1922, a special prosecutor was, was brought in. Again, in 1926, the state also brought in a special prosecutor to, to handle this case. And this, this, is, this is him, Alexander Simpson. There's a couple of notable things about him. Uh, one is that he was, he was closely allied with the, the, the Democratic Party machine of the time based in New Jersey City, uh, based in Jersey City, where uh, the mayor there at the time, Frank Haig, the infamous political boss, uh, was very close friends with the governor at the time who reopened the case. So it was kind of like uh, in, in the in the passage I read from my book when there's this reference from the from the the, the local newspaper saying, you know, it doesn't sit well that these people from Hudson County are, are you know, causing this big uh, to do at the expense of local local taxpayers. Really, that's Alexander Simpson, this guy here and his his uh, allies uh, in the Democratic Party um, and, and in Jersey City who are really like kind of running the the second investigation uh, with with the new Somerset County prosecutor kind of like taking a, a second a second fiddle sort of sort of role. The other thing is about Alexander Simpson. He was very short, as you can see here. He was kind of described uh, as like looking like a like a like a jockey. Um, he was very pugnacious and and dramatic and theatrical in in, uh, in the courtroom. Um, and he also was a very snazzy dresser, and that was something that the press always commented on. Like his his outfits, he wore these colorful outfits you can see here he's 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 like a little a little dandy um so there he is outside somewhere on the grounds of the courthouse this is this is robert mccarter who was the lead defense attorney that francis hall retained to to represent her and her brothers and he was a republican um he had you know was was he was wealthy he came from money whereas alexander simpson um, you know, had a, a more working class upbringing and kind of had to like muscle his way uh, through law school and 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 whatnot. But it set up this contrast between, you know, the 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 defense, this kind of patrician, old money Republican defense that you know was kind of had the same background and value system as Frances Hall and, and her wealthy family, and then the the prosecution, who were these kind of more of these Democrats, these more like working class sort of every guy uh, figures who kind of, you know, had maybe more in common with the Mills family who, who were poor and kind of lived hand to mouth and, you know, had none of the wealth and privilege that the Hall family had. So it was just an interesting dynamic that that was playing out uh, in the courtroom. And the, the proxies for that were this guy, Robert McCarter and, and Alexander Simpson. Uh, this is Charlotte Mills. She's the daughter of Eleanor Mills. She's a great, great character in this story. Um, she you know, was really passionate about trying to solve her mother's murder. And she was very, you know, voluble and spunky. And she gave great quotes to the newspapers and they loved her because she had kind of become, she had taken on like the, as you could see here, she, she called herself a flapper, you know, even though she didn't have like money and she wasn't, you know, going to glamorous, you know, uh, secret cocktail parties in New York, she tried to emulate the style and she very much felt like she was a liberated young woman who had ambition in the world and wanted to go on and, and, and do great things. And she was really determined to, to find justice for her mother. And she basically accused, uh, as much as accused Francis in, in, in the newspapers of, of being behind the murder. And at one point in 1922, she had written a, uh, a letter to the governor of New Jersey at the time, you know, asking for help. Um, and that was printed in the newspaper. So she became this kind of, um, this character that, that the press really loved and that, you know, who really, um, and as, as, and also who, who covered the trial, she actually had a column in the Hearst newspapers, you know, it was ghost written, uh, of course, but she kind of got like a small media career, journalism career out of this, because even after the trial, she had a byline now, um, she went on to get a job with the Daily Mirror for, for a brief period uh, after the trial and, um, actually had a really sad end. She died of, of, of cancer young and without, you know, a, a family and, and without justice for her mother. And, um, but she, at the time was, it was a really, a really strong-willed young woman and a great character, uh, in the book. And here we have Willie. Um, Willie famously was this kind of oddball. He, you know, was, had this kind of very childlike tendencies, though he was very brilliant you could speculate that maybe he would have been somewhere on the autism spectrum. There was really no vocabulary for that back then. But here's a picture of him testifying at the trial. And w Willie's testimony was really notable because everyone expected him to be like this dunce and just totally blow it. But he actually gave a very, very, um, he, he, he performed perfectly. 
and you know stood by that he had nothing to do with the murders and he recounted the story of his and his sister Francis's movements on the murder night and was really just the press kind of ate it up and they, even the Daily Mirror which had you know basically put him in this position they ran a front page saying uh, Willie is Willie is a great great witness and he's so he's another just outsized character from the case and you can see here this is him actually uh, testifying at the trial. Here's here's Francis. She's outside. This is uh, somewhere outside um, on the streets of outside the courthouse. And she's with, a, I believe this is a cousin of hers. I think it's Arthur Carpenter, one of her cousins. Um, so, you know, she was around. She, she hated publicity. She hated that she was the center of attention. She was a proud Victorian woman um, who, you know, claimed basically until the very end during her testimony at trial that she had no idea that there was anything going on between her husband, this this reverend, and this woman from from the, from the church, um, but she knew she had to kind of eventually give the newspaper something because you know they were they were always running these just unflattering photos of her and portraying her as this really like icy, cold, haughty woman. And at a certain point, she did try to kind of woo reporters and pose for the cameras and play along to kind of turn the narrative uh, about herself, kind of take control of her own her own narrative. So we could see her here; she's being photographed at some point uh, outside the trial. And here's a picture, this this to me looks kind of like a composite, but it it could be just you know an authentic um, image, but we have Simpson grilling Francis Hall. It was a really dramatic um, testimony. It went on for, for two days. And like I said, I think for me, the, the climax of this, of her testimony and really one of the most poignant moments in the book is when he's just really coming at her, like how, could you, after hearing all these witnesses talk about this affair and, and how could you say you did not know that, that you know, there was anything between them and, and she kind of like steals herself and clutches the arms of her chair and says something like, I guess seeing all this, you, there, there must have been something going on that I was not aware of. And it's really the first time, at least publicly, that she admits that her husband had been, uh, you know, unfaithful. And, um, uh, and I think, like I said, Simpson was this really pugnacious, aggressive sort of guy. And I think that he really went at her and had and really kind of just forced her into a corner of, of admitting that. Um, the other big highlight from the trial was the testimony of Jane Gibson. Now, Jane Gibson, again, she was the star witness in this because she came forward almost out of nowhere in 1922 when George Totten and Azariah Beekman just weren't getting anywhere. They 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 had nothing to go on and everyone was demanding that this, that they solve this thing, the press, um, you know, the, the governor of New Jersey, the, the public and the pig woman, Jane Gibson comes forward and she claims that she was, she was out in the fields um, near Jerusalem's lane where Edward and Eleanor were, were, were shot and murdered. And she, she basically says that she was there and she saw it and she heard the shots. So that's why she becomes this key figure in the case, though she had all these kind of reliability issues. When, when this came back in 1926, she appeared for the first day of the trial. So that footage that we saw, I believe that must have been from the first day, taken on the first day of the trial, because famously she she collapsed um, at some point uh, and was taken to the hospital. And then it turned out she was very, she was, she was quite ill. She was suffering from a blood infection. It looked like she probably had cancer. She was basically on death's door and she was to be the, the star witness in this, in this case. And it was unclear if she was even actually gonna, gonna survive. And the prosecution, they just wanted to get her there. And after a few weeks, she finally said, you know, I will go, I'm ready to testify. And she famously, you know, was transported uh, via ambulance, which you, which you see here from the hospital in Jersey City, again, because the prosecution, they had all these ties to the, the, the democratic machine in, in Jersey City and they were from there. And they had a better hospital than whatever, you know, the local summer, Somerville or New Brunswick hospitals. And there, there's this procession essentially that, that takes something like three or four hours from Jersey City to downtown Somerville. All along the route, there's people that are following. They have this, you have Jane Gibson in this, in this ambulance, followed by police escorts, followed by cars of reporters and photographers. It was this spectacle. People are shouting at her along the way, like, Joma, oh, that's the pig woman. And here's the scene where she finally arrives at the courthouse in Somerville to these crowds and she's wheeled you know on her stretcher they carry her up the stairs and into the courtroom and that's how she ends up testifying so that's what you see here is here she is on her hospital bed this is not one of the photos I, this photo might be in 
the they might be with the, with the court transcripts in Trenton, but I got this from somewhere else. Um, but this is a pretty pretty good image of what it was like when she testified. She was you know attended by a nurse and a doctor and questioned lying down in bed. You could see here's Francis and her brothers there and um, all pretty close together. And it was you know one of the most dramatic. I mean, probably testimonies in in American court history. I'd, I'd, I'd probably say, um, and this photo, which is from uh, this, is in the in the archive in Trenton. I mean, this is just like the the a, a close up of of what she looked like um, on her bed on the bed there. She was she was pale. She was in really bad shape. She was speaking so quietly that they had to you know um, uh, read back her testimony to the to the jury so that the court. Uh, stenographer can, can get it all down, make sure everyone heard and heard everything. Um, but you know, this is probably like the best, the closest image you're going to get of what it was like when the famous pig woman um, testified uh, during the trial. I know I'm getting close to to, to time here, and I want I want to make sure we have time for questions. I'm just going to run through quickly a bunch of other stuff. This many of you may may know better than I whether or not this display is still there, but this is a display case that is somewhere in a hallway like between the, the Somerset County uh, prosecutor's office now and the courthouse where they actually have some of the famous physical art artifacts from the case. This is the famous Panama hat that Edward was was found in. It was it was over his face when he was found dead. These are his shoes. These are Eleanor Mills shoes. I'm, I don't know if this is definitely still there, but I think it may be. And if, and if none of you have checked it out before. It's, it's very cool. You can see this, this really gruesome <laughs> sort of um, evidence. This is stuff that's not publicly on display, but early on in my research, I was, you know, given a day, I spent a day uh, in the evidence unit at the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office, and they allowed me to access not just the documents they have on file, and also not just the stack of of original copies of the New York Daily Mirror that they, that they also have there, um, which was, was really thrilling to me to find, but the other remaining physical evidence uh, from the case, and I was able to handle this and hold it. This, these are the these are the glasses that uh, Edward was was wearing when he was murdered. These, I was told, were Eleanor's uh, stockings. Uh, the time she was killed, they don't know what became of her dress, her the polka dot dress she was wearing. We, we don't not don't know what happened to that, but the stockings are, are probably the next closest thing. We have Jane Gibson's keys. Uh, we have here. This is her day calendar. This became a very crucial piece of evidence. Um, in, in the trial. Uh, I have it out to the day here, September 16th, uh, when the bodies were found, but the, the date that they were looking at in the trial was actually September 14th to see what she was doing on the night of, of the murders. And I, I didn't take a photo of that, unfortunately, but you can see like this is, this is her, her day calendar with her handwriting on it uh, in pencil. These are random handkerchiefs that were found at the crime scene. They still have them there. Um, this is a famous piece of evidence. The Daily Mirror uncovered, they, they found the famous calling card that was found uh, near Edward's foot that allegedly bore the fingerprints of Willie Stevens. Um, this is like a big blown up photograph of that that the prosecutor's office still has and, and other archives have as well. And here's some front pages of the Daily Mirror. You can kind of see what, what the tabloid coverage looked like at the time. This was all about tabloid newspapers. You, you, know, you, you know what they look like. They're the smaller kind of handheld sort of things. But what was so new about them at the time is that they were photo driven. And, you know, these are the only newspapers that would be putting these like enormous photos of these characters from this from this this wild story on the cover of the newspaper. The, the even the other sort of like, you know, down market uh, newspapers, it was mostly like, you know, the broadsheets mostly had just text. So it was really exciting following this this uh, in, in the tabloids. Here's another um uh, great Daily Mirror cover they used like an illustration here, accusing fingers. Here's the here's the calling card with his fingerprints supposedly on it, and a and a illustration of Willie Stevens with the bodies. Um, you know, this is pretty like wild, racy stuff for a newspaper to be printing. You know, even by today's standards. Um, this is a big photograph of Edward's study that they had. There's a lot of like big blown up photographs that were used as witness in in the in the trial, uh, used in, as evidence in the trial, and the prosecutor's office has a lot of those. Um, you know, some pictures of the Lonely Lovers Lane, Derussi's Lane, where the murders took place, where Edward and Eleanor, you know, famously met for their romantic escapades. Um, I like this shot. It's a really eerie shot. Maybe that's some detective all the way down the lane. And then finally, a big 
you know, image of of the famous crab apple tree, which is where they were they were they were under this tree when their when their bodies were found. And it's kind of like one of the iconic um, symbols of the case. And again, again, this stuff, I think some of these might be in the Rutgers Special Collections archive um, as well. Uh, if the public's interested in checking that out, you can make an appointment through Rutgers to, to see their archive, which has a lot of great stuff in it. But I, I photograph these at the prosecutor's office in Somerset County, which I am going to venture to say that probably any member of the public is not going to be able to, to go get access there, unfortunately. But you can try to see if that's a display case with some of the stuff is, is still there. I want to take as many questions as possible. If you're interested in um, following me, please follow me on Instagram, just at Joe Pompeo. I'll have updates about other appearances. Um, I have my expanded paperback edition that's coming out in the fall. I'll have updates on that. And the other good way to stay up to date with me is to sign up for my, my newsletter. It's just joepompeo.substack.com. You'll come to a page like this. Just type in your email. It's not a paid newsletter or anything like that. You'll get updates from me um, on my work and blood and ink. And also, you know, I do interviews with a lot of other narrative history and historical true crime authors. Um, and that's it. I've, I'm happy to take uh, questions from, from anyone who has them.